So in this video, we're going to take a look at something slightly different. On Windows, you have something called the task manager that shows you all the processes that are running in a Windows environment. In Linux UI, you also have a similar utility, but on the command line, it's really easy. All you do is hit the command top and you get a real time interface showing you what processes are running, which user they belong to and a lot of other information about it, including CPU and memory usage. However, that's not what we're interested in at the moment. You hit Q to exit this command and let's go ahead and clear this. What we're interested in is a non real time output of the same information. And we'll see in a minute why that is important. So the command for that is PS and you pass an argument U to it. That means list the processes. This is very similar to LS, which is directory listing. This is PS, which is for process listing. And we pass it the argument U so that the current users all processes are shown. So if you hit that, you will see that I have uh, Firefox running in my GUI. So what we want to do is we want to see the processes of all users. So we can say PSAU and it will show us the processes belonging to not only NAM, which is my user, but also to root and to guest. Let's go ahead and clear this and uh, take a look at another option. So this is PSAUX. So X stand for uh, a different syntax. Uh, this is from BST and this shows you a slightly different syntax of the same information. So you can see that it has uh, quite a lot of processes over here and it also has some of these processes which are in square brackets. So these are the processes which are run by the kernel. So these are kernel threads and uh, we don't typically want to mess with them. So let's go ahead and consider a scenario in which uh, Firefox is stuck. So first Let's go ahead and clear this and say PSAUX and we want to pass the output of this command to grep so that we can search for Firefox. So when we say PSAUX grep Firefox, it's only going to show me those lines in this output which have Firefox in it. So as you can see, there are quite a few over here and it looks like kind of a mess, but the point of interest is this guy over here, which is my username. So this is my process. And this is the processes ID. So each process is identified using a unique number. And this 1342 is my Firefox's number. So what I want to do now is uh, imagine that Firefox was stuck and it's, it wasn't responding. On Windows, we have uh, a thing called end process. So you go to the task manager, you right click and you say end process. And that's kind of like a suggestion to the operating system to go ahead and try to close Firefox. If you've ever been there uh, as everybody, you would know that end process doesn't really kill it immediately. Right? It takes a little bit of time and then you have to do uh, a couple of end processes again and then uh, eventually the operating system will get rid of the stuck process. Here we have a very different idea. Uh, so once we have this 1342 which is the process ID, we can issue a command which is kill minus 9 and 1342 which is the process ID that we want to uh, kill. So this kill, uh, it looks ominous but the command is essentially used to send a signal and this minus nine signal means terminate immediately. So that minus nine is essentially the kill. The kill word itself is to send the signal. So you say kill minus nine, one, three, four, two, and Firefox is going to go away immediately. No questions asked. So if you say PS Fox, grab Firefox, not there. This one thing over here is not the actual Firefox, but the grep that is looking for Firefox, right? So this is a not exactly Firefox. So as you can see, all the Firefox processes are now gone immediately, right? So let's go ahead and uh, uh, start Firefox again. So I'm going to do that in the background. So I've started Firefox uh, again. And uh, if I hit PS Fox grab Firefox again, you will see that it has now appeared again. So one way to do kill it now, imagining it was stuck, would would be to say kill minus nine two five four zero. So that is the new process ID for this new process Firefox. So we could have done that or what we can do is we can say kill all and simply pass Firefox. So that is going to also PSOX grab Firefox. And as you can see, that Firefox is gone as well because of the kill all. So kill all essentially means send the terminate signal to all the processes that are named Firefox, right? So this is by name and the command that we passed earlier was through the process ID. Now you should be very careful about this kill all because with great power comes great responsibility. 
this is not going to ask you for a confirmation it's not going to save your work it's just going to kill the process immediately and this is very very useful when you have a process that is stuck and it isn't going away so let's go ahead and uh, start a new terminal and what I'm going to do in this terminal is I'm going to issue tail minus f and let's say hello.txt so you would recall that this process tail is going to follow hello.txt because of this minus f switch and it's going to keep running waiting until something is appended to hello.txt and it's going to output over here so we covered that earlier that's not what we're interested in at the moment what we're interested in is instead to go ahead and try and find this tail in our uh, processes so ps aux grab tail and you will see that this tail minus f hello.txt is over here right and the process id is 2764 what i can do is i can prove to you that it is immediately killed by saying kill minus 9 and uh, 2764 right? so there you go killed immediately right? so it doesn't even uh, wait a microsecond it immediately kills the process so if it, this was stuck it would no longer be stuck so in the next video, we're going to take a look at some other commands that help you work with processes. In the previous video, we took a look at how we could filter the running processes from a list. Now let's go ahead and take a look at something slightly different, which is to find out the information about our CPU. So in Windows or in another GUI, you would probably go to settings and find something like my system and then go ahead and see what the CPU was. Here you can simply say cat slash proc slash CPU info and you would get a very detailed information about your processor so i have a intel core 2 duo 300 gigahertz please don't judge me uh, this is a this is a backup system that i'm using for the recording of these videos it's not my main system uh, don't worry about it um, this slash proc is a special directory which holds the information the runtime information about processes and your system so this isn't really a directory it's a virtual directory that has been created in memory and uh, you can use it to query different types of information. So that's all we're interested in at the moment uh, from slash proc. So we can go ahead and say slash proc mem info and similarly it's going to show you very detailed information about your memory. So this is your total memory, your free memory, what is available, buffers, cache. Uh, it has a lot of information over here including what virtual memory has been allocated, what has been used, number of pages. So if you're learning operating systems or if you're taking an operating systems course and you are studying paging and segmentation, you can go ahead and look at this and it will give you a lot of deep understanding about what's going on. Another thing that we can do is we can say cat slash proc slash uh, and before we do that, let's go ahead and say ps aux grab firefox. So this is the firefox process that I have just started and you can see that it has the process id 2860 so we can say cat slash proc slash 2860 so that is the process id so this process id's information is being saved at runtime in slash proc slash 2860 and we can say uh, what is the status of this process right so status and you can see that it will tell us a very detailed information about it what is the name uh, what is the state so it's currently sleeping uh, also um, swap spaces signals handled a lot of information that that if you're trying to learn operating systems this will come in very handy so for instance let, let's take a look at this so this is voluntary context switches so the number of times that the process has yielded uh, to the operating systems voluntarily uh, let's imagine that we're interested in finding just this information so again what we can do is we can take this and we can pass it to grab and we can say voluntary right and it will show us just those lines that match this. Right? So again, it's all about composing different utilities together. So now that we have that, what we're interested in is uh, taking a look uh, at how the voluntary context switches are being changed. Right? So as you can see, they are increasing, but it gets a little problematic to keep doing this up and waiting until it changes. Right? So we have another command for that, and that is a very useful command. What we can do is we can uh, hit up, and we have this whole command. We can enclose it in single quotes so i hit single quote then i hit control a and then i say single quote again right so using the shortcuts that we discussed earlier so we can say watch and this so what watch does is it goes ahead and executes the command that we have passed to it every two seconds by default 
so it's going to keep executing this command and you can see the timer over here so every two seconds it's going to change and it's going to tell us whenever the voluntary context switches are being changed so watch does not have any understanding of the processes it does not know how to search all it knows is keep executing the command again and again after two seconds and it's the responsibility of these two commands to come up with the information that is relevant to us. We can go ahead and change this granularity for the watch command. Uh, by the way, you hit control C to get out and then you say hit up, control A, dash N1, right? So N1 means execute the command that is passed to watch every second. So now this is every one second and it's going to give us in an updated uh, ticker for the for the voluntary context switches. So this is a very useful command. For instance, when you are downloading something on the command line and you want to see how much how much of the file has been downloaded, you can say watch ls minus l and it's going to show you all the uh, current directories. You can pass it through grep to focus on a specific uh, on a specific directory. You can uh, be waiting for some files to come down. So what you can say is ls minus l. So that shows you all the files you can pass it to wc and it will show you the number of lines so that is the number of files that you currently have you can take this and pass it to watch minus n1 and if you are downloading a large number of files this is essentially going to keep a track of how many files have been downloaded so this watch is a very useful command when you're working with uh, Linux command line, when you're working on a server, when you're trying to do almost anything that requires uh, repeated interaction. Let's do something network related. So the first command that we're going to issue is a very famous command known as ifconfig. So you might be aware of its uh, Windows counterpart known as ipconfig. So this ifconfig is in similar vein. This if stands for interface and you can use this if command, ifconfig command for a lot of purposes. We are going to use it just to look at what interfaces we have and what our current IP address is. So if I hit enter, you will see that we have three interfaces over here and this guy over here is my wireless connectivity card. And the IP address that is currently assigned to my machine is this local address. And you can see the broadcast address, you can see the hardware MAC address, you can see a lot of information that is over here. So you can get similar kind of information from Windows IP config as well. Another command that is very useful for debugging network connectivity problems is NSLOOKUP. So this is name server lookup. So let's go ahead and clean this. So we're going to say NSLOOKUP yahoo.com. Let's hit enter. And it's saying yahoo.com is on this address. So that means that at least the uh, domain name to IP address resolution is working. So whenever you're having internet connectivity issues, it can either mean that your DNS server is not resolving IP addresses properly or that you do not have the connectivity. So if you do NS lookup, you can be sure that, that at least DNS server is working correctly. So let's go ahead and see whether we can reach yahoo.com. So we're going to say ping yahoo.com. Again, you might be familiar with the ping command from Windows. The difference is that on Windows, ping stops after a while and you have to pass a switch to it for it to continue working. Here the default is to continue working. So it's going to ping yahoo.com and it's going to continuously ping and tell us what the connectivity parameters are such as the TTL, the time to return, the ping and the sequence number. So this is working fine. Uh, if you want to stop this, we have to explicitly hit control C. So let's go ahead and hit that. So let's take a look at another use case. Let's say you want to figure out which servers are listening on your machine. Maybe you have a runaway process that opened port 8888 and now you can't open that port and you're getting an error and you're not sure which program has opened it or maybe you want to find out if the SSH port 22 is open on your server machine. This might be dangerous since people can potentially log in and cause troubles. So on my machine port 22 is open, but how do we verify that? So let's go ahead and take a look at this very useful command, which is netstat. So this is for network statistics and we are going to pass it a few switches. So we're going to pass it N, T, L, and P. We're going to explain all of these in a minute, but let's hit enter and see what output it produces. So this is telling me all the connections that are in listening mode in my machine. So there are different processes. For example, I have Python listening on port 8112. I have this Wino server, which is listening on port 5900. I have another Wino server on uh, TCP uh, IP version 6. 
I have another Python version on 4.4.3.4 so I have all these over here and you can see that I have this port 22 connection open so anyone can use SSH to log into this machine uh, provided they have the username and password so let's go ahead and explain all of these so n means that it should show numeric addresses and not try to resolve them so if you omit the n it's going to try to resolve this IP address to some meaningful name this T means show TCP connections. So if you also want to see UDP connections, you can append U over here as well. L means show listening sockets only. So if you're not sure about that, you can look up what sockets mean. But essentially the idea is that some processes have opened up the ports and they are listening for incoming connections. And this P, this last switch, it stands for showing the processes associated with open ports so all the processes that are listening on the different ports are being shown over here as always we can do a man netstat to take a look at detailed documentation about this including the switches that we have just seen for instance the numeric switch so you can say dash dash numeric or you can just say dash n right so what's really useful over here is and this is a theme that we've been following around we can say netstat dash ntlp and then we can pass it to grep and grep 22 out of it so it will show me only those lines which have the 22 and i can work in a focused manner to find out the information that i'm interested in instead of getting a page load of information so yes the answer to my question is the port is open but i really need that so all's well in this video we are going to take a look at a case study of how the command line can be used to perform some really powerful operations and the example that we're going to take is to download a YouTube playlist from the command line so if you have ever tried to do that uh, what you do is you go to a playlist you copy the playlist URL you go to some uh, utility or you go to some website and pass it over there and basically you have to go through uh, a few clicks in order to get this to work now we're going to show you how you can do this using a single command from the command line. So the setup is going to take a little while. We are going to explain quite a few concepts in order to get to the end result. But once we have everything set up, which is going to be a one-time activity, whenever you want to download YouTube playlists, all you have to do is issue one single command and the whole playlist will be downloaded for you. Right? So let's go ahead and start with this. So the idea over here is that we are going to have a command which is called YouTube-DM. Right, so currently this command is not available in my machine what we want to do is we want to install it first and as you are aware installation on a computer system requires administrator rights now I am the administrator on this machine but the way Ubuntu works is it lets you run your normal day-to-day -day operations in a restricted environment so you're not the administrator whenever you're doing something when you want to be an administrator you have to tell the Linux kernel that I want to be an administrator now and I want to execute the command with higher privileges right so this is very similar to the user access control of Windows the black screen that you see whenever you try to run something as administrator so essentially what we're trying to do is we're trying to install YouTube-DL now this is a Python utility it depends on Python so Python has to be installed on your machine but Linux comes with Python uh, almost all reasonable flavors of Linux come with Python pre-built right so Python is installed but in order to get the package manager that is available with Python we have to issue a command right so let's go ahead and try to install the Python package manager so the Python package manager is called pip now this pip is not installed right? this pip is not available by default on a Ubuntu machine the one that we're using in order to do that what we do is we use the package manager for Ubuntu so what we're trying to do is use the package manager for Ubuntu to install the package manager for Python and within the package manager for Python which is pip we are going to install YouTube DL right so apt get to pip and then from pip to YouTube DL that's what we're trying to achieve Right, so let's go ahead and try to use apt to install python-pip so that is the name for the uh, pip package in Ubuntu now I must uh, give you a heads up that older Linux systems used to call this apt apt get so both of these commands are going to work for us but for the sake of future compatibility I'm going to use apt if you are on an older Linux machine 
uh, you can use apt-get. Also, if you are on a CentOS machine or a Fedora machine, you might use yum. Or if you are on another Linux flavor, uh, you would use their own package manager. But essentially, python-pip should be available very easily. So let's go ahead and uh, run this command. And as you can see, it's telling me that the permission is denied. That means that I am not root. And it's explicitly asking me, are you root? Root essentially means administrator in Linux terminology. So what I want to do is I want, I want to issue this command as root. In Windows, whenever you try to run some command which requires administrator privileges, Windows gives you a pop-up. Now that is a big security problem. So Linux does not do that. You have to explicitly tell this command that I want to run it as administrator. So you can hit up, the command comes back, you hit control A, you go to the start and you say sudo. So that means do as super user, right? So that will be sudo, sudo and sudo apt install python-pip when you hit enter it's going to install python for you uh, there are sometimes some security issues and it's going to show you some warnings so we can simply say minus y which means uh, answer yes to all the questions and essentially that's going to speed up our installation process so you should try to do this uh, once before uh, once without minus y uh, so that you know what the warnings are but we're going to use dash y and it's going to ask me for my nam user password so there is no separate administrator password it's my user's password and sudo is going to use that to run to elevate my privileges so i'm going to enter my password and the password is not shown as sterex uh, it's going to remain blank and you can enter your password and it's going to go ahead and install the python dash pip package plus everything that is needed for it Right, so it's going ahead it's fairly small so it should be done in um, a few seconds so once that is done uh, we have a fresh prompt and now what we can do is we can say pip install and youtube dash dl right so this is going to be pip install youtube dash dl so this is now going to use the pip package manager the python's package manager which is pip to install the command youtube dash dl now same as before, because we're trying to run this command as administrator, we have to say sudo. And this time, because I just entered my password, it's not going to ask me for my password again. So we can say sudo pip install youtube-dl, and it's going to go ahead and uh, use pip to install youtube-dl. And it should work out quite easily. So successfully install youtube-dl takes a couple of minutes. So this was the one-time activity that you have to understand and we had to do a little bit of explanation. That's why it took a couple of minutes. But now your environment is set up. Whenever you come to a command line, you are going to have YouTube-DL command available, right? So all you have to do is you say YouTube-DL and then in single quotes, you can pass it the whole URL of the YouTube playlist. So the video URL plus the list, everything that you copied from your browser. You simply hit enter and it's going to go ahead and it's going to take a look at all the different videos. So it's saying downloading video one of three, it's going to go ahead and download this video and then the second and then the third automatically. You don't have to do anything. So it's going to by default download at uh, high quality. If you want to take a look at how to download lower quality, how to rename files, there are a lot of options and you can go ahead and do man. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, hit Control C because I don't want to download all the three videos. I already have them on my system. But uh, as you can see, uh, if we do ls, we can see that it has not only downloaded the file but also renamed it to a very useful uh, file name, right? Including the key for the YouTube video. And uh, once it is downloaded, uh, we have the whole MP4 available for us. So in this video, we've covered quite a few concepts through the use case of downloading videos. Please practice with this so that you are fully comfortable with uh, what's going on, especially the APT or the apt package manager for Ubuntu, because that is used uh, a lot for installation of packages. In Windows, you typically have to go somewhere, download a zip file or an MSI file or an exe file, and then install using that. But in the Linux community, the typical way to install packages is through a package manager such as apt. And so please make sure that you are comfortable with this. In summary, what we did was we installed python-pip. This is a one-time activity. Then we went ahead and used pip to install youtube-dl. That was also a one-time activity. And then whenever we want a video, you say, we say youtube-dl and then the URL in single quotes and you're done.